you likely didn't have to eat as many vegetables as you did. The spinach was not that great for Good morning, friends. In this video, I'm going to tell you one more thing that our parents appear to have lied to us about. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video, and comment on the video to help the channel grow. Now let's get started. First of all, I don't know how your experiences were with your parents, but I assume that they were something like my experience. In my experience, I was told as a child by my father and by other relatives of my father that I had to eat my greens to make sure that I grew strong and tall. In fact, frequently I was made to sit in front of some vegetables like okra, for example, which I hated, and I was not allowed to leave the seat where the food was until I finished all of it. Little did I realize that these vegetables were not contributing very much to my development. In this video, I'm going to tell you why a lot of our parents misled us as children when they focus on us eating our vegetables and our greens. Carbohydrates like vegetables don't add that much to our growth in childhood and haven't contributed much to our height over time. In fact, let's get to the history of the subject because human height has changed across the ages according to how much protein consumption we were getting. In fact, with the expansion of farming, humans got way shorter. This was with the expansion and availability of vegetables and crops that were grown intentionally for our consumption. First of all, in human history, there was a major reduction in height between the Paleolithic ages and the Mesolithic ages, in particular during the last glacial maximum, at which time Europeans, and I'm talking mainly about the West, by the way, Europeans got much shorter due to two reasons. One is a reduction in protein consumption. The second, to a lesser degree, is due to gene inflow with the Neolithic expansion which brought to Europe shorter people. In Neolithic Europe, by the time the agricultural expansion from the Middle East had fully affected Europe, European men were the shortest that they ever have been. They were extremely short due to agriculture and their subsistence on low quality cereals as proteins. However, by the late Copper Age, there was again an expansion in height. This happened around the time of the Corded Ware people's expansion. These are Aryans expanding around Europe, bringing with them a genetic genetic predisposition towards tolerating lactose. It's believed that the ability to tolerate lactose, which spread with the Aryans, was the major factor in the expansion of height in the late Copper Ages, because finally Europeans could actually drink protein again, since they had been for so long avoiding protein consumption. This increase in the consumption of dairy due to the spread of genetic predispositions that allowed humans to tolerate lactose into adulthood was the major reason for European height increases since Europeans became very short due to agriculture until the Industrial Revolution. So we developed the genetic predisposition to tolerate lactose in adulthood about 5,000 years ago and then about 5,000 years later with the spread of the Industrial Revolution we became much richer as people therefore much better able to afford good health care as well as produce more food in general which led us to consuming more protein and that was the main reason that about 200 years ago Europeans average height was between 5'8 to 5'9 and now is close to six feet. Just the increase in protein consumption can explain the majority of this. In fact, to confirm this, let's look at a 2020 meta-analysis that considered international consumption of 47 food items and seven socioeconomic levels. What they tried to determine in this meta-analysis, which pulls together a lot of participant data from various studies, was internationally at the moment, what was the greatest predictor in the lifestyles of people that predicted their height and the variance in height between various countries. They found that the greatest predictor by far was not total calorie consumption, but total protein consumption. In agreement with the 2012 meta-analysis, dairy consumption played the largest role among the protein consumption, which could be due partially due to dairy's inclusion of calcium and vitamin D. In this 2020 meta-analysis, out of 93 populations, just knowing their amount of consumption of meats, dairy, and potatoes could predict with 85% accuracy the height of those populations. In the 2020 paper, the authors also found that consumption of cereals and legumes was inversely associated with height, such that when people consume more cereal and legumes, likely because they consume less protein, they ended up shorter. They also found that certain genetic haplogroups that descend in the male line were associated with height among Europeans, such that Europeans with the I haplogroup associated with Vikings were generally taller than other Europeans. The authors of the 2020 meta-analysis conclude by 
is suggesting that governing bodies in world governments are massively underestimating our protein requirements for growth. And there is some evidence of that. Suggested protein consumption among children and mothers is lower than what it should be, most likely. And actually on that subject, I'd like to mention something. Some people may mention that protein consumption is inversely associated with good calcium homeostasis. While it is true that protein consumption affects calcium metabolism, it's shown in studies that increasing protein consumption past the recommended daily allowance still improves the bone integrity later in life. So the effect of protein on IGF-1 signaling is likely stronger and more significant overall than its effect on calcium retention. Now that we've reviewed all the evidence, let's discuss the mechanisms that may be at play. Because what I've noticed from among subscribers that follow my channel is sometimes they think of protein as building blocks to build muscle or skin tissue or something else. Protein is much more, thinking of nutrition as building blocks really limits our ability to understand how nutrition affects our lives. Nutrients are not only building blocks, that means some kind of tool that needs to be used to build something in the body, but nutrients are also signaling molecules. They act like hormones. They send signals to your body, altering biological processes in your body according to how much of certain nutrients you consume. In particular, protein, and particularly protein that comes from animals, tends to be high in amino acids like leucine. Leucine is an amino acid that is recognized by your body as a signaling molecule that's used as a proxy for nutrient sufficiency. When your body sees that it's consuming a lot of leucine, it thinks it's nutritionally sufficient, which leads your body to upregulate growth pathways and downregulate nutrient sensing pathways that are activated when you're low in nutrients. So the AMP kinase pathway, for example, which is very involved in re repairing and rebuilding tissue in your body, will be turned off when you eat much more leucine as a child. Instead, the mTOR pathway, the mechanistic target of rapamycin, which governs pathways like growth hormone and IGF-1 and other growth pathways, will be turned on. And it gets turned on the best by leucine consumption, such that the more animal proteins you consume in your childhood, the more often during the day, the more likely you have mTOR and IGF-1 and growth hormone all turned on all the time. The reverse of this also happens. In adulthood, you sort of want to do the opposite once you've grown to your full stature. You want to avoid, in particular, leucine, in particular, animal proteins, which is one reason that plant proteins are more healthy for adults than animal proteins. The more your mTOR pathway, the growth pathway is turned on as an adult, the quicker you're going to start aging because your cells, the more you make them grow in adulthood, the quicker they get to, for example, senescence or apoptosis. And there are also many other issues like cancer growth and so on. So sort of in adulthood, once we reach our maximal height, we want to do the reverse. We want to lower the amount of times during the day that we eat protein. We want to lower the total amount of protein that we eat. And we want our protein not to come from animal sources. We sort of want the reverse as children in if we want to grow to our maximal heights and not be like Europeans were in the 1600s where their average height was 5'7 to 5'9. So this is another example of the growth versus longevity trade-off. There's a trade-off between choosing to live long, even in childhood maybe potentially, and, cho and choosing to be big. And if one were to choose to be deciding against longevity ever in their life, likely the best time to do so would be early in life as children because that time as a child will have a future impact on a person's subjective well-being. For example, someone is unlikely to become a basketball player or to be a president if they're unusually short and if they do consume protein in higher amounts in childhood, they're less likely to be unusually short. So there's some benefit there. Whereas in adulthood, when eating a lot of protein, one can become more muscular, but otherwise there's not that many benefits one gets for the amount of aging that one incurs on their bodies. So I hope you guys found this interesting. Protein consumption is the most important macro for children, not vegetables. You likely didn't have to eat as many vegetables as you did. The spinach was not that great for your growth. Neither was the okra in my case. Let's review what we learned here. What are the key takeaways? First of all, protein consumption has been the most important determinant of the height of Europeans throughout their thousands of years of history. Second, it is currently around the world, protein consumption being the most most important determinant of global height and the variety in heights that we have around the world, followed by genetics. Third, protein should be thought of not as a building block, but a communicating molecule, something you're taking to turn on or 
off certain growth pathways in your body. And finally, protein requirements are higher than what they're told to us by our governing bodies, particularly for children and particularly for pregnant mothers. And increasing protein consumption among both the mothers and the children will yield stronger, taller, better developed children. Anyway, friends, I hope you found this helpful and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning.